Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing this afternoon. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And uh, we are delighted to be hosting this briefing this afternoon in conjunction with the German Embassy. I think we have a little feedback here. Um, and I wanted to let you know that EESI is an independent nonprofit organization that was formed uh, over 30 years ago by a bipartisan congressional caucus for the purpose of providing policymakers with uh, solid, credible information in a timely way with regard to energy and environmental issues to really develop uh, uh, reservoirs of networks of, of organizations and interests across all sectors in the quest for finding common sense policy options and solutions to energy and environmental problems. And of course, ever since the beginning, EESI's board of directors and our staff has recognized that energy, environment, and economy are very, very closely intertwined and that we do better if we look at all three of those areas together in a holistic way. So today is a great opportunity uh, to take a look at what the state of Germany's energy transition is. Germany has been leading the way in terms of their energy venda over the past 20 years in terms of really looking at the whole role of renewables and efficiency in their uh, national energy policy, how this can all be integrated in terms of their electric power grid. And I must say, those of us here in the United States, have a great opportunity to really take advantage of what we have learned from all of the work that Germany has done. In that, when you, when you look at the whole role of, of um, the amount of, of uh, solar resources, for example, that's in Germany, as compared to what you find throughout the United States, it's really quite remarkable that Germany has led the way with regard to thinking about the development and deployment of solar energy technologies across their country, as well as really pioneering uh, so much work in terms of, again, wind, uh, both on land and certainly offshore. And, and we, as a result, have been able to take advantage of all that investment and all of that learning and which has really helped drive down the cost trajectory and also the learning curve has really advanced us with regard to the learning curve. So we owe Germany a great debt with regard to uh, all of that kind of leadership that we have been able to learn from and, uh, and hopefully we can continue that kind of transatlantic cooperation and learning from each other in so many different ways. So our first speaker today to really talk about what is happening with regard to Germany's energy trans, uh, transition is Mr. Thor, uh, Torsten Herden, who was appointed the Director General as of uh, June uh, uh, 2014 for heating and, and efficiency in Germany's federal ministry for economic affairs and energy. And of course, I think it's very interesting that Germany linked economic and energy uh, in the ministry, uh, because that really goes to show, again, how critically important energy is to running our various countries' economies. Uh, Mr. Hurden has been very involved, uh, has a long history in terms of working in organizations uh, and professional associations with regard to engineering and engine systems, as well as research uh, associations where he has led many efforts with regard to that, and was the managing director as well of the German Engineering uh, Federation's Energy Forum, which was responsible for developing their positions on energy policy. 
In addition, he has served on the board of the European Association of Internal Combustion Engine Manufacturers. He's on the board and the supervisory board of the European Wind Energy Association and is vice president of the Offshore Wind Energy Foundation. So I am delighted to turn the podium over to Mr. Hurden. Yeah, Carol, thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for this uh, big interest uh, in, in Germany. Uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, allowing me to give you sort of a brief overview of what we have done and what we want to do in the future. Um, we are living, as you all know, in critical times right now. Um, and um, my visit uh, to the US this time, uh, which I started on Tuesday and I end with this uh, event here, is uh, to try to seek some sort of um, a, call it de-escalation uh, route uh, in order to get the transatlantic dialogue better. We all know that uh, G7 is coming up uh, right now and uh, the signals are not as good as from other G7 summits uh, and uh, we hope we can still send out a signal to the world that uh, it needs to have a collaboration and I will um, represent my minister at the G20 energy ministerial meeting next week in Bariloche in Argentina and also there we'll see uh, whether or not the G20 is able to send clear signals in terms of uh, what energy means to not only the environment, but as Carol said, uh, to the economy. And that is the reason why uh, I actually joined uh, the Ministry of, environment, uh, of, of Economic Affairs and uh, Energy, that uh, our government put that together. And that for me was a very important point to go from business into government, which is not the normal way in Germany. So what I'm not doing today is uh, lecturing you to say what you should have to do, because uh, that is uh, certainly not uh, necessary. I think that's also something which uh, should we not do. We should not tell the others what they have to do, uh, because everybody has to live it in its own environment, in its own circumstances. You have different starting points, uh, you may have different targets. But what I can tell you and what I will tell you is what we have done and what lessons we have learned. And in that respect, uh, I'm particularly looking also at the mistakes we made. Uh, that is sometimes uh, looked at very curiously. Why is he talking about mistakes? Um, but I think that is something where we can learn from each other in order not to duplicate or triple or quadruple or whatever the mistakes. Um, by saying that, of course, I would also um, hit me on my own shoulder uh, to say what have we done good. Um, but I think it's also important to know about the mistakes. So for us, the energy transition, as Carol said, uh, is the combination of renewable energy and energy efficiency. That are, for us, two twins uh, which have to love each other and which have to go together in order to get uh, the economy decarbonized. Uh, at least uh, that is what um, the um, worldwide community has uh, not only expressed but has uh, underlined and signed the Paris Agreement um, that we only allow ourselves to uh, emit a certain budget of CO2 emissions uh, into the atmosphere and uh, that means um, that we have to act rapidly, fast uh, and with clear targets. And for us, and that is different to other countries and that is uh, fair enough that every country can define its own energy mix, but for us it's uh, energy efficiency and it is renewables, for us it is not nuclear uh, and for us uh, it's uh, not CCS in terms of coal-fired power plants, which then uh, will subtract the CCS and put it down to earth. It will be CCUS. I think we will not live without that uh, because there are some processes where it's hardly um, impossible uh, to reduce CO2 emissions, but that are the two factors for us. To give you a, four, a first uh, short overview on, on, on our energy mix so that you have a uh, a clue of uh, on what we are talking about. Uh, we have an overall energy demand in Germany at about 2,500 terawatt hours. So forget about the, the terawatt hours, but remember the 2,500. Half of that, half of that around 1,250 is for heat. So half of all our energy is for heat, for heating houses and for high temperature heat in industry. Half of that. Only 600 out of this uh, 2,500 is electricity. So it's only a small portion. It is a 
not a very small one, but it's not the biggest portion. And then another 700 is for transport. So half of it heat and almost the same for transport and for electricity. Bearing that in mind, uh, it's quite clear what we have to address. Um, and we started with our energy transition by addressing electricity because it's the easiest way to address it. And electricity can only also help uh, to decarbonize other sectors like the heating sector and like the transport sector. So therefore, we felt that it's a good idea to address electricity first. And uh, what we did there was uh, very... Um, <laughs> was very powerful in terms of uh, we went into a non, not at all mature technology in terms of PV, in terms of uh, wind energy, in terms of bioenergy, in terms of geothermal energy and said uh, we pay whatever is necessary in order to make the projects bankable um, and in order to make the projects fly. And that was 50 cents per kilowatt hour at the starting point uh, for a feed-in tariff for photovoltaics. 50 euro cents per kilowatt hour. A huge amount of money, a huge amount of money. And uh, we found at the end of the day that uh, we have two winners in Germany. The one is wind, uh, be it onshore, be it offshore. And the other one is photovoltaics. Um, the rest didn't in decrease uh, their cost that dramatically as the other two did. Uh, and uh, we then changed uh, some two years ago this feed-in tariff into an auctioning model and we saw the prices coming down even more dramatically. And uh, the latest prices are for PV. Remember we had the starting point with 50. And the latest prices were about 4 cents per kilowatt hour in the very sunny region uh, of the world in Germany. Uh, and with wind, uh, we are also at about four cents uh, per kilowatt hour onshore. And we had the first auction on offshore wind, uh, which was zero. Zero in that case that they said, I don't need any subsidy at all. I'm taking just the market price, uh, what the market mechanism says. Uh, and for that, I can build the offshore wind farm. All I need is the permission to build an offshore wind farm and grid connection. So um, the message simply is why I'm saying that is that the prices, as Carol said, uh, have come down dramatically, dramatically. We have that money, of course, in our backpack. Um, so other countries around the world are profiting from that, what we did. Uh, but that is fine, as we are profiting, uh, by the way, from the shale revolution right now in the US, uh, that the prices of gas are going down dramatically in, in Europe. So that's also some sort of helping each other. Um, but the message I can always convey to everybody, if you now go into renewables, you are going in renewables on a very, very competitive base. They are cheap, they are not expensive, uh, and therefore the German energy transition will never appear for others because uh, the high amount of money we paid at the beginning is not necessary for you to pay if you enter into the game right now. Um, so that is uh, some first remarks uh, on that. Um, or does that continue? Here I go. Very good. So, um, for each and every government, it's uh, extremely important um, that you set yourself targets. According to those targets, um, agree on measures. Do a monitoring of those measures, whether you reach the targets, and if you don't reach the targets, you have to think about new measures uh, or change the measures. That's the reason why we have given ourselves targets uh, in the various ranges, and you see climate target, you see renewable target, and you see energy efficiency target. I don't want to go into the various details of the targets because we have put targets uh, underneath, but the important thing is that we give ourselves a climate target, a renewables, and an energy efficiency target. And if you see that we would like to decrease the energy demand by 50% till the year 2050, that means that we will not deindustrialize Germany, but we will grow whilst we reduce our energy demand. I will come back to that later and you see how necessary it is um, that you are uh, going that way of uh, giving you targets, defining measures, um, and then uh, react accordingly. For instance, what we will not achieve, the world knows that quite well, is our climate target for 2020. So what we've done right now, we just passed uh, through our cabinet uh, last week, um, the decision that the commission will bring um, or will present us a proposal by end of this year 
how to phase out coal. How to phase out coal because we absolutely know that uh, with our coal-fired power plants for us it would be impossible to meet the climate targets. On the other hand, you cannot simply shut them off. There's a security of supply uh, issue and there is an issue, of course, of people which are working in the coal business and you cannot just tell them due to climate reason, I'm so sorry, you don't have anything to work anymore. Try to do something different. So you have to do a structural change there and that uh, we have now initiated because we saw that our measures didn't succeed in terms of climate protection. Um, what you see here is uh, the renewables in the electricity sector because now I'm going a little bit on this 600 uh, terawatt hours out of the 2,500 in terms of electricity. And what you can see is we came from almost nothing um, in the very early stages of our energy transition and we are now at 37%. So nowadays, 37% of our electricity production is done by renewables. The vast majority is done by wind and photovoltaics. To give you a number, we have a, uh, a demand which ranges between 40 gigawatts up to 85 gigawatts, depending on daytime and weekend and so on, 40 to 85. And we have a renewable capacity in terms of wind and PV installed in Germany over 100 gigawatts. So that means our installed capacity is even higher than the biggest uh, demand we have in Germany. Therefore, we have the high percentages in our system. And I can tell you what, the grid is extremely stable. We have grid uh, um, disruption a year at about 12 minutes. So 12 minutes a year is effectively nothing. So we could, um, could cope with the question, can we adopt the high share of renewables, uh, the volatile ones in our grid? And we achieved that and we would like to talk with you, of course, uh, how uh, did we achieve that? Uh, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? Uh, and how can that perhaps be done in, in the States? That is a very interesting uh, figure. And um, with everybody I'm talking around the world um, on transparency, I tell them, try to get your data on electricity production uh, real time. We didn't have that uh, for a long time and all the various uh, lobby groups told us uh, a lot of interesting stories. Uh, and we then said we need to have in real time the electricity produced in every second uh, from every source that we know what's going on. And uh, if you see that graph, uh, you can see various things in there. First of all, you see the fluctuating demand uh, we have and our demand curve is the red one. So the red curve uh, is the electricity demand in Germany. And then you can see the production. From the very, top, you, uh, from the very bottom you see um, biomass, you see hydro, you see offshore wind, you see onshore wind, and the yellow one then is PV, photovoltaics. And you see in Germany, the peak of photovoltaics fits perfectly with our demand peak. That is different in the US. So therefore, it's also different uh, if you are thinking about measures, how to deal with it. Uh, but for us, it fits perfectly, so then we have to adopt our measures uh, to this fit. Uh, and then you can see, uh, like at the first of, uh, no, no, at the 21st of May, at the very beginning, you can see that the red line, the demand, touches the yellow one. That means at that point of time, we had 100% renewables, uh, supply for our demand. So we had really complete demand supply by renewables. But you can also see another issue, and that is the, the upper curve. The upper curve, the, the, the so what brown one, that's the price. So that is the electricity price uh, at our stock exchange. And what you can see is that at that point of time, when the renewables were 100%, the price went down and it was negative. So we had a negative price. And what we say is, uh, fine, there is nothing bad in negative prices because that very clearly tells the other generators how to behave. Because you see that um, all the time when there is um, uh, above the red line, uh, the power generation line that we, uh, that we export electricity and if it's below that we import electricity. 
And at that point of time, of course, there was much, uh, a lot of uh, electricity to be exported. And all of a sudden, there was not enough demand from other countries uh, around Germany and Europe. And then the price was negative. That forced the generators, specifically the coal generators, um, to change their behavior. So not to produce electricity, but instead uh, of that, uh, um, shut them down or reducing them or whatever is possible. And what you also can see in this graph is uh, that what we need for this fluctuating renewable energy in the, in the electricity mix is not baseload. Baseload is poison for our energy transition in Germany. What you need is flexibility because uh, sun is shining and uh, then you have PV production, wind is blowing, and then you have wind production. So it's not according to demand, it's according to weather conditions, which means uh, they are there in any case, and then you need to have flexibility to fill the gap. And the flexibility can be um, a different one. It could be peakers, uh, gas peakers, or whatever it is, very fast uh, power generators. It could be storage, it could be demand side management, or it could be neighbors. And that is something uh, I've also discussed with my colleagues from the Department of State or Department of Energy that I said, if you integrate uh, yourself in the various states in the US, you can see that you can help each other. We, for instance, are just building a power line from Germany into Norway because they have a lot of water. We have a lot of wind in the north, uh, so we can make use of each other. That's the cheapest flexibility you can think of. We don't need to build for that storage facilities, which are much more expensive. So all you do have to do now is to create a market, an electricity market, where prices tell the truth. So that they say, there is too much electricity in the game, the, I will become negative, and where prices also tell the flexibilities that they are needed at that point of time, and then the cheapest flexibility will fill the gap. So that is uh, a learning curve uh, in Germany. Of course, as I said at the beginning, it's different in the various uh, countries around the world and also in the US, but this principle of uh, if you increase uh, volatile renewable energy, you need to have flexibility and no base load. That is valid for each and every country in the world. So um, that is something uh, we established uh, last year and we heavily use in order to uh, not be told by lobby groups that uh, offshore wind power is the best one or coal generators are the most flexible ones or whatever. We can see what happens uh, and then we can tell them how they should behave or the market tells them how they should behave. The last slide uh, before I stop is um, empty, okay? It's not empty. Now it's full. Um, that comes back to my first, um, uh, first uh, issue uh, on energy efficiency and you can see the following that we completely decoupled, completely decoupled economic growth and uh, energy demand. And I think that is something where we have to pay high attention in each and every country that of course uh, the best kilowatt hour is that kilowatt hour which you don't need uh, because then you don't need to build power plants in order to pr produce it. But that means also that you have to install measures in order to get the energy efficiency in place. What I've learned in the last few days is that still in the US there is a high demand for energy efficient products. Because in the states, in the various US states, everybody feels that it's not only worthwhile, but it's good for your pocket if you save energy. And I think with the digitalization we are um, uh, we, we are going, not only we are going in, we, which is already there and which will continue to grow, we have millions of business models uh, where you can uh, put demand and supply together in order to save energy and the one is delivering the other one uh, energy, be it electricity, be it heat or whatever it is. And um, therefore we have to pay high attention on the energy efficiency in order to uh, achieve our goals and and I would say to order to be, in order to be competitive, because that economy which does not need that energy as other economies uh, is more competitive. I think that is to, clear for everybody. So therefore, again, our energy transition consists of renewables and energy efficiency of uh, two twins uh, which love each other and will bring us into the future. Thank you very much for listening.
we're going to try this again. Um, and I want to say, okay, I, I just want to say thank you very, very much for uh, taking us through that walk with regard to your progress uh, and the issues that you have dealt with over these last number of years. And once again, I think that it's very useful for us to understand how these things really are integrated, as you talked about the twins, and how important it is that we can really optimize so much in the way of systems as a result of doing that. And I must also say that I've been struck over the years and and even you know in the last few months as I talk to more and more people in the uh, efficiency services area, uh, efficiency products area, how much more efficiency we still have to gain because we are not nearly as efficient in across sectors as what we have the potential to do. So um, all of that, I think, spells wonderful opportunities for, for businesses, for, for all of us. So I want to turn to our next speaker now, uh, who is Lisa Jacobson. And I am very glad to say that Lisa and I have been colleagues and friends for many years. She is the president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, where she manages, where she's been managing uh, the day-to-day -day operation of uh, the Business Council for a number of years. And in that capacity, she has also been uh, involved in advising states, local governments, working hand in glove with uh, with various companies and industries since the Business Council is, uh, is a council involving uh, renewables and efficiency companies as well as natural gas. Uh, she has been involved in testifying before Congress on behalf of the Business Council and is uh, part of the uh, member of the Department of State's Energy Efficiency Committee. So uh, she's obviously been involved working on climate negotiations for many years as well. So we are happy to welcome Lisa. Thank you very much, Carol. And it's a pleasure to be here today. And I want to thank EESI and, of course, the German Embassy for hosting the event. And it is just so wonderful to have such a good um, crowd today for this discussion because I don't think it could be more timely, either on the energy front or the geopolitical front. So I very much look forward to your questions. So I was going to first uh, tell you a little bit about the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. The Business Council is a trade association. We are based here in Washington, D.C., but we do do work at the, the state and regional level as well. And um, we've focused since the early 1990s on promoting policies that expand deployment and reduce the cost for a range of sustainable energy technologies and services. And our primary core sectors of focus are energy efficiency, natural gas, and renewable energy. One of the first things that the organization did when it was founded in 1992 was attend the Rio Earth Summit. I'm not sure how, let's see a show of hands. Does anyone know what the Rio Earth Summit is? It's a good number. Um, it was a really seminal moment um, in terms of multilateral cooperation on global environmental issues, and it had been building since the 1970s and culminated with the creation of four global environmental treaties. One of them addresses climate change, one of them addresses um, uh, biodiversification, I mean, sorry, uh, biodiversity, and the other desertification, and the other one some might know um, dealing with a range of additional greenhouse gas emissions, the Montreal Protocol. So those four treaties were really seminal. And the one that my organization was particularly involved in was the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I mention it because uh, the German government has been extremely active and a true leader through that process. And most recently, I had the pleasure of being in Germany in December for one of the ministerial sessions of that negotiation. So I just wanted to thank you for hosting that conference and for all the work over many years that the German government does to promote um, climate mitigation and, activity and, and adaptation activities across the world. But my comments today are, you know, complement very nicely what we just heard, which is a little bit more about the U.S. story. So we can think about some of the data that I will share with you, and then um, 
in the discussion, maybe you'll have some questions that, that might drill down to some of the differences and, and some places where we're kind of similarly pointed in the right direction. So this information that I'm sharing with you is from an annual report that the Council produces called the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. There's some materials right where you entered if you want to grab them on the way out. But all this information is available for free online off of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy's webpage. And if you were to print out the fact book, this is what it would look like. It's about 150 of the most important facts that we think policymakers, industry, and the media should know about U.S. energy markets. So it covers electricity, but it also covers transportation. Uh, it focuses on technology deployment and technology economics. So I encourage you to take a look at it. And if you were to just open up any page in the printout, you would, you would see these charts and figures. And what I like about this is that not only does it give you the data, but it also includes some commentary to put it in perspective. So I hope that you will take a look at the fact book, and I'm going to give you a few uh, slides from it right now. I also wanted to say that the fact book you know, something that the council commissions, but it's an independently authored publication by Bloomberg New Energy Finance. So the, the first fact that I'd like to share with you complements the, the final slide that we just saw about energy consumption and economic growth. And as you'll see here in this slide, we're showing over the last decade that our economic growth increased over 15 percent and our primary energy consumption was reduced by 1 percent. And then we see this hockey stick type uh, figure here showing the decoupling between economic growth and energy consumption. This really want, runs counter to many decades of thinking about how economies grow. So this is a major point. And so we're not just seeing it in the United States, we're seeing it in Germany and we're seeing it in many other countries. Another point about this is why are we seeing this? And the Business Council and Bloomberg New Energy Finance have looked into it. And clearly, as, as we all know, we can see it in our, in our lives, there is a greater attention to energy efficiency. We have more uh, innovation and new opportunities to uh, reduce our energy use cost effectively. But we've assessed this and point to a resource from the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy to say that approximately 60 percent of this is attributed to energy efficiency policies, some of them here in Washington and some in, at the state and local level. So that's a real important piece for you to remember. Your work matters, the impact of policy matters in terms of getting results like this. The next slide I wanted to show you is just a breakout of the U.S. energy mix. And pretty much all the data in the fact book, you know, we strive to be as up to date as possible, goes through the end of 2017. So what you're seeing here is the power sector electricity generation mix. And when you go from the top to the bottom, the blue area is renewable energy, and that includes hydropower. The next area is natural gas, which is gray. And then the red represents nuclear power. And the bottom area, the darker area, represents coal. There's a little bit of oil in there right above the coal, but it's very hard to see. We don't use very much oil to generate electricity in the United States anymore. There are a few really staggering things when I look at this. Number one, the rate of change. We are seeing a very dramatic shift in terms of coal for power generation in the US electricity sector. If you were to go back 10 years, coal production was reduced by 38 percent in terms of um, the generation mix. And then if you go way up at the top, in the blue area, you see renewable energy. And that started out at about 9 percent, and we ended at about uh, 18 percent at the end of 2017. That is a 90 percent increase in renewable energy generation. So this is a set of industries that hadn't really changed much in 100 years, and we are seeing sweeping changes here, not only in terms of the benefits and increase in energy efficiency, but also in terms of the technologies that we are using to electrify the country. I would also want to note the gray area, significant change in terms of the use of natural gas for power generation, nearly a 50 percent increase. So again, uh, big changes, and they have implications, and we'll talk about those in a moment. On renewables, because that is a major focus of today's discussion, 
18% of the generation mix, that is almost on par with our nuclear fleet. So this is a main street, main, main um, focus of our energy sector. Mainstream, I couldn't say that word for some reason. It's mainstream within the energy sector, and I'm going to break it out for you in a moment, and you, you can see what's underpinning that number. So here I have two charts for you. Um, I'm going to bring both of them up. On the, on the left-hand side is renewable energy build. And so it's showing each year what's getting built and how much. And I think the big takeaway here is wind and solar represented in the yellow uh, and the blue, blue being wind, yellow being solar, you know, dramatic and steady state increases over time. And then if you look at the total cumulative capacity in the renewable energy sector, you see the impact of other technologies, in particular hydropower, which is a major generator. Nearly 50% is generated from hydropower. And you can see cumulatively the impact of these different renewable technologies. And, and there you'll see more of biomass, waste to energy, you know, and, and geothermal, other contributors that are really important to the U.S. renewable energy sector. So I'm going to just go one forward, and then I'll come back to that slide. So there was a lot of discussion on technology cost, and that's a prime concern here in the U.S. marketplace as well. This chart is a little hard to understand at first glance, but let me walk you through it. This is basically showing what power purchase agreement prices are for wind and solar throughout the country. And it's broken out by a number of different regions of the country. So all the way um, here on the left-hand side is Texas, ERCOT, going across the country. We have the southwest region, California, southeast, PJM, which is the mid-Atlantic region, MISO, which is Midwest primarily, and New York. It doesn't capture New England on this chart, but this is a pretty good view of what's going on in the country based on real projects and real power purchase agreements. If you look in the pink area across it, that's the range of wholesale power prices in those different regions. So the important thing to see is, is the yellow and blue either above or below or on top of that line. If it, if it touches that line, that means that they were comparable and competitive within the price range. If it's below it, it means it costs less than the average wholesale power price in the region. So I think the key takeaway here, this is worth further study depending on you know, where, you know, where you're representing in terms of the country, but it's showing that there are so many parts of the country where these are economic and also there are places in the country, in particular very windy places, where wind energy is very cost competitive and below the average wholesale power price. So I want to come back to this slide now. So that's all fine and good. It's good to know what the power purchase price is, but what do consumers experience? And we're, I just said we're going through significant period of change in the electricity sector. We are making big investments in terms of renewables, um, in terms of energy and electricity infrastructure, in terms of energy efficiency, but what do consumers experience? So the council and BNF have been looking at kind of wholesale budgets and what proportion of an annual house, uh, sorry, household budget. Um, the, the council has been looking at what a typical household might spend on energy and electricity and natural gas and how has that changed over time. And what we found is that we are nearly at record lows for both electricity, energy, and clearly for natural gas in terms of the proportion of money that a household might spend on those costs. So we, for electricity, at the end of 2017, we were in fact at a record low. Since the record started in 1959, consumers in households had not spent less as a proportion of their household budget on energy than any time on record. So really an amazing set of data there. I want to wrap up with just a snapshot on emissions. You know, we are making this transition because of a range of reasons. We're doing it for air quality, climate, economic, resilience, reliability. I mean, we could go down the list. There are so many benefits of making this change. And I wanted to highlight a key area here in terms of the change. 
Our emissions have really gone down dramatically in the power sector, 27-year low at the end of 2017. But what you may want to notice here is that while the power sector emissions are going down, our transportation emissions are going up. So this is very important that we address the transportation sector. And while we're doing all of this, the companies and consumers are getting more involved in the way we use energy, and they're making their own decisions. So I think when I look at the trend lines for emissions coming down across the economy, and in particular in the transportation and power sectors, this gives me tremendous hope. So this is showing corporate procurement of clean energy, and in this case, mostly renewable energy, over the last several years. And you just see a dramatic uptick in this type of investment from the corporate sector. And it's not just technology companies. If you get a chance to look at this slide, you'll see Anheuser-Busch, you will see General Mills, you'll see Target. So it's really expanding beyond just the big name tech companies that people hear so much about. But I wouldn't want you to think it's just about renewable energy. There's a lot going on with energy efficiency as well, and we're going to hear from Siemens soon. I'm sure they will talk about it. So this is just a few of the, the leading players involved in both renewables and energy efficiency leader, leadership at the corporate level. This is what to watch. These are going to continue to expand those trend lines in terms of our energy productivity and our emissions reductions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lisa. And we will now turn to hear from Siemens. Uh, and we are delighted that Todd Thurlow is here with us today. Todd is the director in the Distributed Energy, um, in the Distributed Energy Systems Center of Competence at Siemens, where he works with customers to develop distributed energy solutions. He brings more than 20 years of experience in terms of looking at energy markets and working with end-use clients as well as utilities to figure out their strategic energy objectives. And he is able to especially do that because of having an extensive engineering technical background. And Siemens obviously plays a very important role in uh, North America technology deployment, and so we are very glad to have Todd with us. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. First of all, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, obviously, as part of being, being a part of a large German company, uh, we have the opportunity to collaborate closely with colleagues in Germany, learn from uh, uh, you know, successes they've had in that market, share the values um, technologically and from a market perspective there that I think we benefit from here in the US, certainly in Siemens. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is a trend that I think is very complementary to what we've, we've been talking about thus far. To, you know, Lisa and Torsten talked about largely decarbonization of the electric system. I want to talk about decentralization of the system, which I think, again, very, you'll see is, is very complementary to, uh, did I go backwards? Okay, very complementary uh, to the decarbonization. Um, this is what the grid has looked like historically, right? Large central station power plants, some renewable, some fossil, moving electricity to high voltage transmission lines through a distribution system and directly to consumers, right? It's unidirectional electrons flowed from the point of production to the point of consumption. And this is, again, historically largely what the grid has looked like. In many places, it looks this way today. But we're going through a period of transformation. The energy system is becoming much more complex. Um, there's much more uh, generation that's happening at or near the point of consumption. Um, whether, and the simplest example is rooftop uh, photovoltaic. Uh, but in addition to that, now we have storage solutions, uh, we have small wind solutions, uh, gas-fired combined heat and power solutions. So we're starting to see, again, a more complex utility grid, uh, largely driven by these grid edge technologies, not just power production, but also demand side management programs, uh, energy efficiency programs, uh, storage on the grid, um, which are creating challenges for the utilities, um, both from a technologic 
perspective, now we have bi-directional flow in many places of electrons uh, from the consumer back onto the distribution grid, uh, causing utilities to have to invest in, if you've heard of grid modernization, they've had to invest in smart meters, uh, feeder automation, and, and greater and more complex software systems to manage their, their grid system. Utilities have also gone through and are going through business transformations, understanding how to participate in this more decentralized uh, energy market. Uh, in, in many cases, they're seeing their kilowatt hour of sales declining or remaining flat. So how do they uh, continue to make um, uh, recover for their capital investments and provide the services and solutions that their, their end users need? From a consumer perspective, um, there are more options that offer uh, greater uh, access to sustainable solutions, renewable energy, um, and greater control over their supply. From a system perspective, this transformation to decentralization uh, has a number of positive impacts to the system. Increased reliability, uh, reduced energy costs, improved resiliency, um, reduced carbon footprint, and, and enhanced control. Now, I work most closely and most frequently with the end users. So I'm gonna talk for a minute about the consumer perspective uh, versus, say, the utility perspective. And we're talking consumers that we work with, um, hospitals, uh, airports, uh, campuses, universities, these types of folks. And there are really three strong drivers uh, for, for these types of end users to evaluate, implement uh, distributed energy solutions. The first, economics. Is there a cost savings opportunity here for them? And those cost savings are driven by some of the things we've already uh, heard about. The continued decline in the technology costs, solar PV decline, um, storage, battery decline, uh, cost decline. So we're seeing a continued decline in these costs that are making these technologies much more competitive. Uh, gas prices, the ongoing um, and expected uh, low gas prices here in the U.S create a spark spread, the difference between the, the price of electricity in the market and the price to generate electricity from gas, to be attractive and are having more customers looking at doing small combined heat and power and other small gas fire generation uh, projects. Um, additionally, there's, and incentives are a big player in that as well. We have the federal investment tax uh, incentive, 30% on solar, 10% on, on CHP, that's a big one, and the states as well. For example, in California, where you have the, the SGIP or the self-generation incentive program, these are strong drivers of, um, uh, of distributed energy projects for commercial and industrial customers. Um, the second key driver, economics being the first, the second is a greater focus on resiliency. We've all experienced in the last few years um, would, you know, a, a seeming increase in the frequency of weather events, whether it's Superstorm Sandy, um, Hurricane Harvey, wildfires in Sonoma County, et cetera. This is causing consumers to look at the resiliency of their supply, their exposure to outages from the grid, and looking at solutions like microgrids um, that can provide a greater uh, resilient and more resilient supply of electricity for their production for their um, operation. The th and the third key driver is sustainability. Um, you know, and the desire, as, as Lisa showed, a, a lot of uh, corporations making commitments to utilize renewable energy to reduce their carbon footprint, and that is a key driver for uh, the, de the, the uh, decentralized energy uh, transformation as well. Again, the most basic, most um, prolific example is rooftop solar, but there are others as well that support that. So broadly speaking, um, you know, these, these trends, the shift in the fuel mix, in, ad in addition to what I talked about from a consumer perspective, from a macro perspective, the shift in the fuel mix, the more competitiveness of the technology costs, um, the favorable regulation, and the general trend of decarbonization have uh, you know, culminated in, in a perspective that we're gonna see more uh, of the generation mix being developed as distributed or decentralized projects, smaller projects. They re represented about 50% of all the generation built in 2010, and you can see from the graph here that the expectation is that that percentage will increase. 
over 60 percent by 2020 and then continuing on by 2030. So we are seeing a transformation in the, uh, the grid mix, the production mix, to a more decentralized uh, focus. What is Siemens doing? A couple of things I wanted to share with you about what Siemens is doing in the face of these, these market trends. Um, we've made some important acquisitions. Uh, Rolls-Royce and Dresser Rand were important acquisitions that expand our portfolio of products and services uh, in the sort of small generation space. Uh, we've uh, done a joint venture with Gamesa to be one of the top uh, wind manufacturers in the world. Um, and most recently, we formed a joint venture with AES uh, named Fluence to be what is now the global leader in battery storage. Uh, we have over 68 projects in 16 countries around the world um, and see a tremendous growth in the battery storage market. So these four things represent almost $20 billion of investment by Siemens um, in this space and have expanded our portfolio of products, services, and solutions to a range from small power to wind to microgrids and automation there. To complement this, um, you know, we've also developed uh, a range of creative and innovative financial and commercial solutions. Uh, Siemens Financial Services has a $25 billion uh, global portfolio, an A-plus rating, and a real value driver we can bring to our customers where the capital cost of doing a distributed energy project um, may be a hurdle for them. So we've got um, approximately $8 billion of investment in energy projects in the U.S., and as I mentioned, we've created a, a, a broad portfolio of, of solutions from lease offerings to loans to um, design build, third party design build, own operate, maintain uh, type structures. So a range of structures to help foster the implementation of these solutions with our customers. Um, and, and so with that, I, I'll stop there and say thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Todd. And as you were just commenting about Siemens uh, reading, it made me think uh, also about an announcement that Moody's made uh, certainly more than a year ago with regard to sustainability becoming a part of how they are rating uh, companies and communities in terms of, of bond ratings. So that all of this during is is becoming much more of an issue as lisa talked about uh corporations that are in as todd talked about the investments that have been made by by siemens and as we also heard uh from from Torsen as far as looking at the policies and investments that germany has made it's really quite incredible uh, in terms of thinking about the immense amount of change that has occurred during this last decade or so and that we are living in a very exciting time of much much change and in the in the whole energy sector and i think that it can be very very exciting what's really important is that um, we sort of needed to happen very quickly because we are also facing enormous environmental challenges. So let's open it up for a much broader discussion to hear what your comments or questions may be of this terrific panel of experts. Anybody want to ask? Okay, we'll start back here. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, my name is uh, John Mosheim and I work for uh, a small uh, consulting company that deals with uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gas reductions. Can you and speak I had up a, a little bit? Sure. We're having difficulty hearing you. And uh, I had a question for Mr. Harden. Was, did Germany ever uh, evaluate or experience uh, implementation of a, a carbon tax as a measure to reduce, I guess, to control greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, first, uh, first of all, um, we have the European Emission Trading uh, System, the ETS, uh, which we are uh, right now renovating um, a lot because um, we started up with a system where um, 
we gave a lot of credits uh, specifically to the industry, uh, which is in worldwide competition, and uh, that led to the fact that uh, the budget was met, yes, uh, but the price was too low uh, as to have incentives in order to uh, continue a low carbon uh, way for many, many reasons. So uh, that is on the way of renovating, uh, and that is also uh, part of that uh, clean energy package for Europeans, the debate on that. So for that, we want to go on a European way because we feel that uh, if each and every country in Europe goes its own way, uh, they don't fit to each other and then it doesn't create an energy union what we actually need in Europe. Um, that's for the for the ETS, uh, the emission trading system. And then we have the non-ETS sector uh, that is mainly buildings, uh, transport, um, parts of the industry and uh, agriculture. And there we are facing uh, the same problem as uh, Lisa showed that uh, the US is bad uh, in getting uh, the transport on track. And we are even uh, bad in getting the transport on track. So our, our emissions in the transport sector are, are increasing. They are not decreasing. And uh, there are a lot of uh, debates right now um, in Germany um, from all of the lobby groups uh, to think about um, a carbon price. I uh, wouldn't call it tax, but a carbon uh, measure in, in order to address it. And um, um, in our collision treaty, uh, we don't have uh, any uh, task like that, um, um, I have to say. So we don't have uh, the task to, to do so. Um, and the time will show, I would call it that way, uh, what the lobby groups uh, will tell us. Um, i give you one example. We have, a, we have a mismatch of pricing for electricity and um, gas. Um, and that creates a big problem uh, in energy savings, uh, specifically in the heat sector. So we can select from 20, 30, 40 different suppliers by internet. So I can now change uh, my gas supplier via internet. I do it in once, uh, one minute, really. Uh, I can change my electricity supplier in the internet. But the range of, uh, of, of prices is for gas, four cents, around four cents, uh, euro cents per kilowatt hour, and for electricity, 30 cents per kilowatt hour. So there is no way uh, that anybody should think that he will uh, change uh, a gas boiler, for instance, uh, by a heat pump, uh, which is uh, driven by electricity, uh, with this uh, price difference. And I think uh, on the long run, on the long run, we have to be very clear that if we have given, and that's what we did ourselves, that emission budget in Paris uh, to meet uh, the two degrees um, increase, uh, that the demand for fossils will be reduced. It must be reduced, as a, otherwise it wouldn't work. So if this will be reduced, the clear logic is uh, that the price will continue to go down because there is a lot of uh, fossils there. And the Shell Revolution, I think, shows quite clearly how much there is. Um, and then we have to ask ourselves at one point of time, and that must be a fast point of time, uh, either we get a price on, on CO2 or we have to acknowledge uh, that we cannot prevent economies from using the cheap sources. So that is a debate going on in Germany uh, right now. Uh, we as a government currently have no plans as we have to fulfill our collision treaty, um, but let's see what the time will bring. Thank you. Okay, question right over here. Oh, hi. So uh, my name is Raj Lakiani. I work for a uh, grid resilience company <clears throat> called Athena Power. Uh, so quick question on, um, where you see electricity prices going given the advent of extreme weather events. So if we look at, you know, some of the coastal areas in our country that basically have to harden the grid, um, I'm going to assume that ratepayers are going to have to pay for that, which means a higher uh, cost per kilowatt hour. Um, and then also related, you guys had a slide on electricity consumption sort of um, depleting um, with the advent also of electric vehicles uh, and, and certainly the push from, you know, all players, the automobile industry and utilities. Uh, do you still uh, assume that that's going to stay consistent, just uh, consumption going down? Thanks. Uh, two really interesting questions. Um, 
I mean, I, I don't have a definitive answer in the council. This is not a forecast. I mean, what we produce with BNEF right now is, a, you know, just a factual, try to be as up to date as possible type of resource. It's not forecasting out electricity or energy prices. BNEF and other analysts, you know, do provide that, but I, I can't speak to that. But, you know, I, I can share what I've seen with some of our utility members over the past several years, you know, coming off of Sandy and then, you know, what is being done after the storms last last summer. There is a process by which the utility, I'm talking now just about the utilities, so not the entire economy, um, but when there are costs associated with um, restoring power, restoring services, thinking about how to plan for them in the future and what types of resources or investments need to be made. A lot of that is done at the state level, through, you know, in, co in concert, either if they're a public utility with their local government or if they're investor-owned utility with their public utility commission. And they go through an annual or sometimes every two or three years a process by which they decide, you know, really what they will invest in. And that's where a lot of this question comes up. And of course, there is a huge emphasis on affordability and making sure that, you know, the costs are, if there are going to be new costs, that they're socialized appropriately within that jurisdiction. But, you know, it has not been an easy process. I look back at what PSEG tried to pursue right after Sandy, which was a very large grid modernization um, proposal that they sent to their utility commission. And initially, it, it largely was said, you know, sorry, we need to, re this is way too much investment. We're worried about impacts on consumers. And we need to rethink this a little bit. So they proved a little bit of it, and then a uh, bulk of it wasn't done. And, you know, what we've also seen is we're getting more economic data from the storms or these or wildfires or any number of um, disasters is that pre-mitigation has a huge payoff in the long run. So here's a situation where we had tremendous disruption in, in um, New Jersey and, and other states in the mid-Atlantic and northeast region, and appropriate plans were put forward. Um, and, but the initial reaction, maybe not to the specific proposals, was, oh my, this might add costs, even though maybe some of those investments would have saved dollars in a future storm. So I think we have a challenge uh, working with the regula regulatory community in trying to find a better way to quantify the benefits of pre-mitigation investments or investments in electric power infrastructure, and it's not fully resolved. So it's an ongoing issue. It is of prime importance to the public utility commissioners and others making those decisions. Your second question was about, uh, you know, what we might expect in terms of electricity uh, demand going forward. Yes, those slides don't contemplate significant electric vehicle or, or other um, aspects of electrification if it happens at a much larger scale uh, than we have right now. So, I mean, I think. It's possible that that could change. You know, we were looking at energy, total energy, not electricity versus GDP. So we we're looking at total energy. So that might net it out a little bit. But yeah, we may see some shifts in terms of where the energy sector grows or declines based on a deep electrification initiative. Stop there. Yeah, for, 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 for the two points, um, First, what we see is uh, there will be not the electricity price uh, that changes uh, dramatically because, as Todd uh, explained, we are not uh, only undergoing a energy transition and a revolution from uh, one fuel to the other. We're also going undergoing a revolution from decentralized uh, from centralized to absolutely decentralized uh, with digitalization on top of that. So, what we see right now is um, that the, there is a variety of business models. Uh, we have the first ones, and you have that in the US too, uh, where there are intelligent companies putting together, let's say, 20 uh, or 30 or whatever households, uh, combine them with uh, whatsoever decentralized generation or storage facility, and then they have their price. That's interesting enough. That's interesting enough, and I think we will see different prices. And in Germany, for instance, uh, as I said, we have a range of electricity prices, which is between three cents per kilowatt hour, that's stock exchange, and 30 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, uh, with this, uh, which is for the private person to pay, because we pay the backpack uh, for uh, getting the renewables price down at the very beginning. And of course, we pay a lot for, um, uh, for, for grid enlargement. Yeah? But um, that will change 
completely dramatically and we'll see a lot of different uh, uh, pricing uh, issues around that would, uh, would be very clear. Uh, the, other, the other aspect um, um, is on that, on that um, the second point was... Um, Electrification yeah, demand. exactly. I, I, I think that uh, we will see a, a shift uh, in any case that we will have a higher percentage of uh, um, electric uh, um, electricity in the overall energy demand. What I don't see uh, is uh, an all-electric world uh, because there are certain applications, be it aircraft, be it uh, shipping uh, business uh, or high-temperature process uh, heating, uh, which it's, where it's hard to imagine how to do this with electricity and perhaps there are cheaper options. Uh, but there will be an in-between product, uh, which uh, may be electricity, which will increase. So what we've uh, just done um, recently is uh, we, we allowed uh, an offshore wind farm to be um, built in our uh, North Sea, which is not grid-connected. So what they are doing is they are just producing hydrogen offshore and bring it down to shore because they have their customers. So then you can argue is that electricity, you know, at the end it's hydrogen, but in between there was electricity. So therefore the world is getting uh, more and more electric, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question over here and then we'll come over here. Okay. Over here. Um, yeah, considering uh, recent innovations and its uh, ability to be used as like a base load power source, how do you, uh, all of you see um, geothermal playing into the uh, energy mix in the future? I can answer that very quick. Yes, there is a high potential worldwide. No, there is no big potential in Germany. Different energy transitions in different countries. <laughs> right. Did you want to add anything, Lisa? Um, maybe just that... You know, it's really, again, going back to the point about policy, I mean, there, first of all, geothermal is, you know, an, a really valued resource in our renewable portfolio, and where, you know, we can capture that resource, we should be doing it, you know. Um, and I, my point really just related to kind of some federal policy dynamics. So how can the federal government play a role if we wanted to pursue more geothermal? We could, you know, invest in research, development, and deployment, and we could ensure that other policies that we have um, treat geothermal as well as other renewable technologies in a level playing field. And one area where that hasn't really happened for geothermal has been on tax policy. And so making sure that when we're looking at our tax measures that we are treating uh, energy resources, not just it, it's to say a level playing field is a little too simplistic because these industries have very different business models. So I would more say creating uh, measures, and if, in this case this is an incentive, make sure that they match the business models and the needs for investors in that sector. So what might work for wind might be very different for geothermal, and in fact it is. And I would just add that geothermal has, as you were alluding, uh, some benefits that are not necessarily priced out the same way as, as some of the other resources, and that that's very important to keep in mind, as well as the fact that geothermal is both important from an electricity point of view on a larger scale as well as thinking about the whole role of geosourced heat pumps. Todd, do you want to add to that? Well, I was just going to say, I think as you said in your question, that you know what makes geothermal somewhat unique is that it's one of the few uh, controllable renewable technologies, uh, you know, not, unlike wind and solar. Um, so there's a lot of value there in that. I think, um, you know, my experience with geothermal, one of the greatest cost risks associated with that is, you know, the reservoir uh, analysis and, and the quote unquote dry hole risk of, you know, what do we have for a thermal reservoir? So if that risk can be overcome, you know, the technology cost is com it can be competitive for geothermal. Um, and there are certainly areas in this country as well as certainly globally where geothermal is a really rich, rich resource. Okay, over, um, over here, then back here. Well, okay, we'll start over here and then we'll work our way back down. Okay, I'm pointing to the guy on the end. Sorry about that. 
uh, Gustav Tyler from the Heinrich Böll Foundation, a German political foundation. Um, so what we heard from Mr. Turlo, is that correct, um, is that like uh, the energy grid is being decentralized and the uh, feed-in system in Germany in the first part of the energy vendor greatly contributed to that. Do you see a threat, Mr. Herdan, uh, that um, the shift to the auction system reverses this development to some degree? No, I don't see any problem with that because um you see, with a feed-in tariff that was necessary, if you start by zero, uh, you need to create a bankable product. Uh, and if you try by, by zero to auction something, that doesn't work at all. That would have been extremely costly. So, but at then was the time when we had um, more than 20% and even more of uh, renewables share. Uh, and then we said uh, there is really no need that the government sets the price without knowing what the price would be uh, if, the, if you would let the market decide. But the government should set the quantity you will need to install every year, which then also goes in line with the grid expansion. That's the very difference. Um, and then the market would set the price and the market reacted to that. And we saw a lot of projects uh, which are small ones coming in. But we didn't uh, do the auction, of course, for the very decentralized uh, uh, area. So let's say rooftops, uh, they are still in the fixed feed-in tariff because an auction for, I don't know what, a 10 uh, kV uh, rooftop uh, solar panel is a little bit of a nonsense. So um, I think uh, that will then be overcome because uh, the, the cost of energy is going that dramatically down um, that it's... Uh, uh, I would say in a few years' time, not necessary to have uh, an auction or any uh, feed-in tariff at all. The only thing you have to guarantee, the only thing you have to guarantee is uh, that you have uh, undiscriminate, undiscriminated uh, access to the grid. Uh, and perhaps that could be an auction model later on, that uh, we just auction the uh, undiscriminated uh, exit to the grid. Uh, um, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the point. Okay. Uh, if you could all put your hands up again, uh, uh, the gentleman in the blue suit back there, and then we'll work our way down. Hi, my name is Morgan. I'm from Congressman Ron Kine's office. Um, I have a question that's kind of similar to the one uh, in regards to geothermal um, about uh, hydropower. Um, I've just know that it's traditionally been a large part of like the renewable energy push um, for the past 50 years or so, especially in America. But uh, I have read a lot of research uh, more recently that's pointing towards it maybe not being a great solution uh, in terms of it being sustainable with how it impacts um, watersheds and water resources um, in consuming water to be used and stored for that uh, energy potential. So I was wondering um, what your opinions were on the future of hydro power in uh, renewable energy generation. Well, I would, I would just point you to one of our board members, the National Hydropower Association, and they have tremendous resources. On, I'm sorry, I, couldn't, I can't see the gentleman who was speaking. Okay, um, about hydropower in general and all the issues you raise. And I think they're really important because um, communities need to feel comfortable with the energy resources. They're demanding it. They want to have more control over the energy resources that they, they benefit from. You know, from the Business Council's perspective, I'd also like to highlight the tremendous opportunity that hydropower provides. I mean, again, right now, it's pretty much half of our renewable energy fleet as a country, and it offers, I like that word, controllable, um, renewable resource. And, you know, so it's, it's a really big part of our system. But what I find really interesting about hydropower, there was a Department of Energy report called Hydrovision that's come out in the last couple of years, where it talks about what basically improvements, efficiency gains, incremental investment in the current hydropower fleet can deliver in terms of new renewable energy resources. It's a tremendous amount. So I think we have to look you know, holistically as we're making decisions on energy investments, but I would encourage you to check out the Hydrovision report because it's very extensive. And I think it will answer some of the questions you might have, but it also shows you, you know, the significant value that hydropower provides today and what it can in the future. Carol, I don't know if you have any other comments to make. The only other things that I would raise, uh, it's important to recognize that I think it's only about 3% of all the dams in the U.S. actually have hydro generators on them. 
Uh, and that, as Lisa said, as we look at all of the new turbines that have become available, the efficiency of those is just being gigantically improved. The, uh, you know, there are issues with regard to thinking about, as we are looking at more and more in terms of climate events, what happens as far as snowpacks, the adequacy of that, what that means for water supply and release, so that those are issues that are becoming of greater concern. But there's also a whole range of additional technologies in the water area that frankly are really, really um, fascinating that are available in terms of looking at marine uh, hydrokinetic um, uh, run of stream that do not require new uh, large impoundments. And in fact, there are other places, as we, as we look at the changes and the opportunities that can be brought, it's really amazing the innovation that folks are finding. For example, in terms of thinking about um, water systems, in terms of all of our water pipe infrastructures, many of them are gravity fed. And so as you look at that, you can pick up power, if you put in little turbines in a lot of these water pipes, you can pick up a lot of electricity that way. Uh, small amounts, but you know it all counts up, and it's pretty fascinating, and it's also locally generated. Uh, did you want to add anything, Todd? Well, I was just going to add that, um, you know, as Torsten mentioned in his talk, the, the need, the greater need for flexibility yeah. um, associated with the renewables. Now, I know, uh, you know, so as you mentioned, not all hydro projects are the same. For example, um, you know, you have pumped storage projects, and I know folks who are working on pumped storage projects, which are essentially a closed loop of, you know, you pump water up at night when the demand on the system is low, and then that's available during the day when, uh, you know, you may have some renewable variation or some other needs of the system that, that is, that's available. So it creates that flexibility, that storage, and essentially it's, it's a closed system. So there, as you mentioned, there's a number of technologies that are water related that can be valuable to the system. Uh, terrific, okay, we have a series of, okay, right over here. Thank you. I'm Yuan Chen from Congressman Bill Foster's office, and I have two questions regarding to grid interconnections. The first is, with the share of renewables keep increasing, if we have larger scale of grid interconnections, will the demand of energy storage increase or decrease? And the second is, what is your comments on a larger scale of grid interconnections, for example, is it possible to have a global interconnection, grid interconnections? Thank you. Um, first of all, um, I don't know whether the demand of storage will increase. What I know is, uh, as Todd said, uh, the demand of flexibility will increase, will increase dramatically. And if uh, storage whatsoever, because it's, uh, storage is not uh, doesn't equal uh, to storage. Uh, so many different storage devices uh, from that one up to uh, pumped hydro, um, and that's somewhat different. But if storage, uh, whatever sort, uh, proves to be the cheapest flexibility and the market is going to choose that storage, then of course storage will also increase. So that's uh, the question uh, we have to raise. Uh, always coming down to flexibility, that's what we need. And storage is one sort of that. And the other, other, other aspect I would say, uh, why not? <laughs> um, I cannot say yes because I don't have a crystal ball in my hand, but I would say why not? If it is possible, uh, and it is to dig out gas in Siberia and to bring it down five, six, seven thousand kilometers uh, into Europe, in competitive prices, uh, obviously, why should it not be uh, possible uh, to dig out electricity uh, in China to bring it down uh, to Europe? Why should it not be possible to dig out uh, the sun in the Atacama Desert and bring it down to, uh, to Europe uh, in hydrogen format? So all I'm saying is uh, I, don't, I think there will be a lot of innovations uh, in the next decades to come. And what we should make use of uh, is follow this innovation line and trying to be in the driver's seat uh, if it comes to our economies, uh, finding out uh, the innovation and making money with that and helping the world. Hello. 
Heather Spence. I'm a AAAS fellow in the uh, Department of Energy's Water Power Technologies Office, and I'm interested to hear more about your perspectives on marine energy, such as tidal or wave, um, what you envision its role to be potentially in, in Germany or more broadly. Perhaps to start uh, with, with uh, Germany, we have a lot of um, R&D going on in all sorts of, uh, call it water-connected energy technologies. Uh, so far, um, they have, for Germany, only for Germany, not uh, been proven uh, to be successful in terms of, uh, uh, of, terms of uh, prices. Um, I don't know how that will continue, but uh, as it was said before, um, the, the water as such, whether it's uh, tidal, whether it's wave, whether it's pumped hydro, whether it's uh, uh, rivers or whatever, I think has a huge potential uh, worldwide uh, to, to grow, a huge potential to grow. Uh, giving you one example, we have uh, just recently built, not we as a government, but uh, one of our companies uh, in, in Germany, recently, recently built uh, a hydro storage tower. I don't know what it is, 80 meters or so, uh, for a decentralized purpose. Uh, and that worked out and proved to be successful uh, on, the, on the pricing issue. So uh, that's fine. Um, I think worldwide there is a lot of potential, but uh, again, it's not the glass bowl in our hands. Uh, so far for Germany, the two winners were wind and PV that uh, we have to, um, uh, to, to, to see. Hmm? Okay, uh, question right down here. But you know you can always figure out how to do turbines attached to those offshore wind farms and cable that in, right? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Michael. I'm from Congressman Womack's office, and my question is uh, if the United States wanted to pursue a similar policy to Germany where we would get more and more of our energy from renewable resources, where would be the uh, best place economically to begin doing that? Would it be investing in more offshore wind farms or more solar farms or hydroelectric dams or geothermal plants, things such as that? I think um, I'm going to go to my colleagues' comments. I know from many of the industries that I represent, we're looking for a marketplace that provides value on different technology, on different services or benefits to energy production and use. And we're not quite there yet, and we have a lot of change. So we have a lot of new um, technologies that weren't available when a lot of the rules of the road were were set for how we would generate. Uh, and distribute energy resources. So I think we wouldn't focus as much on any particular technology per se, but we would try to set a long-term vision through the pricing structures, through market-based structures, to help uh, achieve the ultimate goals that we seek. And so one of the areas that's a big focus, I mean, obviously there are um, environmental benefits, there are economic benefits, and one area that we're working a lot on right now, as we talked about, was like resilience and reliability benefits, and how do, in this case, electricity markets quantify those and then help make investments to ensure that that's what's delivered, if that's the goal. And, and part of it is it's very local. These are local decisions in many cases in our current regulatory structure. There is also a role for the federal government in certain markets in the country, but it's largely done at the state level. So. It's a very complicated but exciting time. But again, we try to look at fuel neutral policies. We set a long-term goal and then really let the marketplace make the decision so we can have what we believe would be the most cost-effective outcome. But I have to say that it's not a perfect system. So we're not starting from scratch. We are starting with a system where decisions and preferences are already built in. So that's a little challenging. But nonetheless, I see increasingly um, those that are making these decisions see a vision very much described on what this panel has been discussing and trying their best to get to that outcome. So it may be a little messy here and there, not perfect along the way, but I'm seeing more of a consensus in terms of the vision and what's possible, and then they will adapt the rules to um, try to get to those objectives. Okay, and I would just add that we have seen in many places, many states, about 30 states have had renewable portfolio standards because they've had a really broad range of renewable resources that made sense to develop. And so that you have um, 
States like my home state of Iowa, for example, you have Texas that have enormous amounts of wind that they put on the grid because it economically has made so much sense and that they have really driven down the price of electricity and furthermore, there are more and more dollars staying local because of where it's being generated. So that's just one, one little example. Todd? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Lisa said. I mean, you have to sort of let the market determine what makes sense. And, and in historically, what we've seen is it's largely driven by the resource availability, right? You have a big swath of the middle of the country that is, is wind dominated because you have that resource in that wind alley. In the west, you have solar. In the northwest, you have hydro. In the northeast, biomass. So, you know, a lot of it is uh, a function of the resource availability and the economics of that resource. Um, I think what we have to do is continue to price in the value of resi resiliency, as Lisa said. Um, you know, what is the value of having that rooftop solar or that, that decentralized energy project to the grid, but also the capital cost avoidance to a transmission or a distribution system upgrade? And how does that get priced in? So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's those issues and how they affect the economic competitiveness of the different technologies. And there's been a lot of discussion about flexibility, and I think, as, as Lisa has raised too, the whole issue of resilience is becoming increasingly important across the country, uh, as we've seen more and more in the way of extreme weather events. And so we have been very glad to see, on both sides of the hill, um, uh, concern expressed about this resilience and the need to address it through, for example, um, uh, looking at amendments to the FAA, the, the Federal Aviation Authorization Bill, in terms of looking at, at disaster mitigation as, as a way to really look at some of these issues, certainly in the built uh, infrastructure area. We had a couple other questions. Okay, okay, let's go here first, and then we'll go over here. And that'll be about it. Um, I'm Daniela Cheslo, I'm with NPR. Could you, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. I'm Daniela Cheslo, I'm with NPR, and I was wondering, I saw a lot of private German investors um, were showing up in Puerto Rico to offer ideas for renewable energy, and I was wondering if there's any German government support for uh, exporting your technology to different places in America. Yeah, there is, there is a lot, actually. <laughs> Um, we, we do it in, in, in three or four ways, let me say four ways. Uh, first of all, what we're doing is uh, that with all our international energy partnerships, uh, and we're doing a lot with California, for instance, uh, and uh, of course the states as such, um, we are trying to explain what we have experienced over our energy transition period of time and uh, what I said before, mistakes uh, done and uh, lessons learned. And then we take our industry with us uh, so that they can make contact directly and see where there are business models uh, which are good for them. And uh, if, if, if others see that they are experienced, that they can solve, for instance, the problems with the grid and uh, integrate high shares of renewables, uh, then you have the business contact and uh, something hopefully will happen. Uh, the second point is what we're doing. We have uh, a so-called export initiative uh, where we take uh, small and medium-sized companies to various countries around the world. Uh, they define the technology, they define the country, and we go with them together uh, because for the small and medium-sized companies it's a problem uh, to find the partners around the world. The third point we have is uh, that within the international formats, be it G7, G20, uh, or the International Energy Agency, the International Renewable Energy Agency, um, that we um, do that also the business uh, type of thing together with it. Um, and, and the fourth is uh, that uh, with our um, uh, Ministry for International Cooperation, uh, we have a lot of uh, money associated uh, to specific projects. But what we not, so that are the four uh, ways. What we are not doing is uh, taking taxpayers' money from Germany uh, in order to build uh, whatsoever uh, renewable power plants in other countries in the world, because then you never know where to start and where to end, and the German taxpayer hopefully, uh, most probably, will not be that happy about it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And we'll take one last question right over here.
natural gas. I think I do better with O. Oh. There you go. We're on NPR. Uh, <laughs> now we can really. The hear question you is whether we're going to move to a, and, in, and particularly in Germany, I'm interested to a no carbon economy or a low carbon economy, and how do you see the future of natural gas in this country? Frankly, it's increasingly controversial because of some of the local impacts, environmental and, and the rest. So how about natural gas and where are we going to head on that, on that curve? Yeah. I think that was also to me. Yeah? Um, at the end of the day, we have to be in a no carbon economy or we can forget about our Paris goals and we see an increase in temperature uh, around the globe and uh, the ultimate uh, search for another planet. Um, so I think that is uh, quite, quite obvious and quite clear. Um, but there is a, a way to go there. And uh, for us, uh, natural gas uh, is, a, is a bridge technology, uh, but that is a long bridge and a wide bridge um, and, and a good bridge. Uh, and we don't know how long it takes us, uh, but it's certainly not for a few years only to come. I would say it's for decades um, and gas uh, I'm not now talking about natural gas, I'm talking about gas. Gas has the possibility to also be renewable uh, at some point of time. Uh, it, it is, of course, not uh, natural gas, uh, where, where, where coal cannot be renewable. Coal is coal, uh, full stop, uh, and it carries the CO2 uh, around. But um, we see that, for instance, in Germany, we need to have the fuel switch from coal to gas, which dramatically would reduce CO2 emissions uh, in Germany, and that's valid for many, many other countries in the world. Look into China, and, 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 and that's what you've done with the Shell Revolution, uh, actually, as Lisa showed quite clearly, in the power sector in the US. Um, and there are many, many possibilities uh, for, for natural gas, and therefore we see that uh, our natural gas demand in all over Europe but also specifically in Germany, will increase for the power sector in any case, uh, for the industry sector also. And um, the question is, do we get uh, the efficiency, the energy efficiency faster so that uh, the consumption of gas in Germany for heating purposes uh, uh, will decrease? But uh, all over in the next decade, we see an increase in, in natural gas. And then uh, we have to think about what natural or what gas infrastructure do we need? And now I'm talking about gas which can also be adapted then um, to renewable gas infrastructure. And, and it's nothing uh, which is only a vision, uh, you know. Uh, if we say we build an offshore wind farm which produces hydrogen, uh, that is renewable hydrogen, that's also gas, and that will be used for high temperature um, in, in, in industry uh, applications. I can tell you one, one thing uh, about future and vision, uh, because nobody knows what the future will bring. But when I worked in industry for a long, long time, um, I, I met a, um, uh, a good friend then of mine. His name was Franz Tacke. Uh, he was the guy who founded Tacke Windtechnik, which, which became Enron and then GE. So that is the founder of uh, GE Wind, at least. Um, and there were the two in Germany, Anarcon uh, with Alois Woppen and Franz Tacke with Tacke. And uh, it must have been some 20 years ago. And he told me, Thorsten, what do you think about? Uh, we have, will receive all the problems of wind turbines on land. Why should we not put them in the sea? I said, what? Yeah, think about uh, having wind turbines in the sea. Uh, there is a much more constant wind speed and, and, and. And I looked at him and said, uh, what type of uh, drugs you have taken, uh, by the way? So it was absolutely out of any uh, idea that we would build offshore wind farms. Uh, so therefore, I would say there is a bridge uh, of natural gas, and I personally f think that we will see a lot of uh, renewable gas uh, in, the, in the future. Perhaps not in the near future, but uh, in the future. I just wanted to mention quickly uh, another issue that has been raised with regard to natural gas, though, as, as we look at increasing amounts being used, for example, here in the U.S. for, for power generation, et cetera. Do we also need to be really looking at the capture of CO2, its utilization and potential sequestration from that because of the gargantuan quantities that we're looking at? Well, I, I think that uh, the CCUS, specifically in industry, is some sort of a must. Um, I also think that this combination uh, with uh, enhanced oil recovery uh, is a business model. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, for us uh, in Germany, um, the CCS, uh, in order to continue coal-fired power plants uh, to generate electricity, is a no-go. Uh, because we feel that's a, that's a dead end uh, in some point. Uh, there we have other options uh, to follow. But for industry, uh, I think we will see CCUS, no doubt. So unfortunately, we are now past the hour, and I want to thank all of you for coming, and I hope that you all learned a lot. And I want to thank our wonderful panel for our terrific discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>